nation like a person has to have a certain inner drive in order to succeed. In economic affairs, that inner drive is called the competitive spirit. On January 29th, 1786, Thomas Jefferson, United States Minister to France, receives a request to his office from a Genevan family. Can he find their son, Albert? The young man went off to America to make his fortune and have a little fun. He had been in Boston, did a stint in New York, was in Virginia, and last they heard, he was in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. And now there are rumors of an Indian raid there. He hadn't written home. Was he all right? It was a heck of a way to be introduced to someone, the young man of the Gallatin family, who would affect Jefferson and his politics for the next 20 years. Oh, in reality, Albert was fine. He was just stingy with his correspondence. By the time Jefferson contacted John Jay, and John Jay put an ad in the Pennsylvania packet, Gallatin and his family had indeed exchanged letters. Gallatin was busy. He was working on his 400-acre farm called New Geneva. It was odd to see a Swiss man in these parts, but he built up a reputation quickly for his smarts and his know-how. At one point, George Washington visits this area of Pennsylvania. I have to realize the area around Pittsburgh is really the growth center, the future promise of the United States at the time right after the Revolution. And there's a lot of land speculation there. And George Washington is a land owner in this area, as is Gallatin. And there's a meeting of local people. George Washington attends. They're considering where to build a road. And Gallatin keeps saying, you have to build it here. He's insistent. And several times he interrupts Washington. And he gets this icy cold stare from the general of the American armies. Who is this person? It's only later that Washington realizes Gallatin's right. This is the best place to build the road. He asks if Gallatin would be interested in working for Washington. Gallatin says, no, he's a landover himself, and he has every intention of buying more land. The people in the area also see the same talent that Washington saw, and they send him to the Constitutional Convention of Pennsylvania, and then to the state legislature. There he heads the Committee of Ways and Means, builds up Pennsylvania's finances, pays down debts, balances budget, and is elected by grateful members to the U.S. Senate in 1793. Here he was outspoken against Federalists, against the Washington administration's financial plans, against what Alexander Hamilton was doing. Saying that he had not been a citizen long enough, he had been uh, achieved his citizenship in 1785, the U.S. Senate kicked him out by one vote. He was devastated about it. But Western Pennsylvania saw him as a martyr and elected him to the House and the state legislature at the same time. He served in the House. And when James Madison, who had kind of been the opposition leader, the leader of opposition to the Jay Treaty and to the unpopular treaty with the the Great Britain during the Washington administration, the summer Hamilton's plan, when James Madison takes a position in the state of Virginia, Gallatin in the House becomes the leader of the opposition. Present revenues of the United States arise from external duties on tonnage and imports, internal duties on domestic distilled spirits, on snuff and refined sugar manufactured within the United States, on sales at auction, on retailers of wines and foreign spirits, and on carriages used for the conveyance of persons. It also comes from postages and from dividends on the shares owned by the United States in the stock of the Bank of the United States. The statement number two exhibits the yearly amount from the establishment of the present government to the first day of January 1795. 
Jefferson and Madison opposed the large-scale financial system that Alexander Hamilton had developed. The loans, the assumptions of debt, the sinking funds. But they were at a disadvantage. There were experts in law and in science. Jefferson knew all about the classification, animals and trees. He had read many, if not most, of the great works of literature that one could be expected to read. Madison was an expert in the law and how to use the law and how to write a constitution. But finance escaped them. James Madison suggested Albert Gallatin, who had a talent. Yes, he was disliked by some because he was foreign-born, and politically that was easy to paint as pro-French. But Jefferson saw that he has the right mind to help us. The accounts for the year 1795 are not yet published, but the actual receipts on account of duties amount for year to dollars five million five hundred and eighty eight thousand nine hundred and sixty one and twenty six cents. The total amount of receipts from the first of August seventeen eighty nine, when the duties were first laid, to the first of January seventeen ninety six is dollars twenty two million seven hundred and fifty five thousand nine hundred and ninety eight and twenty eight cents. Wow, that's a lot of numbers. What he's basically saying there, in the one budget year of seventeen ninety five, he's estimating that you're going to receive five point five million dollars to the federal government in taxes. And since the creation of the nation, they received twenty two million in revenues. The following estimate, calculated on what from a comparison of the importations and re-exportations for the four last years, appears to be the present average rate of the annual consumption of the duties articles. Carriages and glass manufacturers, other than those of black bottles and window glass, $60,000 in revenue. All brass copper, steel, iron, tin, pewter, leather, and starch manufacturers, china, earthen and stoneware, window glass plate and jewelry, clocks and watches, carpeting, hats and stockings, gloves, buttons, buckles, saddles, and upholsters, trimmings, paper hanging, sheathing and cartridge paper, cabinet wear, painter's colors, $795,000. All linen or cotton manufacturers, either printed, stained, or colored, $450,000 in revenue. Gallatin calls it a sketch of the finances of the United States. What it was really was an instruction manual for rebellious opposing Jeffersonian Republicans of exactly what Hamilton's plan was, what the finances of the United States. He, it's almost an explanation of the economy. And cotton manufacturers, neither printed, stained, or colored, velvets, silk, woolen, and paper manufacturers, clothing, ready-made, brushes, canes, faddles, black glass bottles, lamp black, anchors, hinges, locks, hose anvils, and vices. One million seventy thousand. Books, clothes, furniture, and tools of persons migrating to America. Philosophical apparatus imported for the use of any feminary of learning. Bullion, copper, old pewter and tin and pigs, brass, and iron wire, wool, wood, dyeing drugs and woods, furs and hides, wine, plaster of Paris, $480,000 in revenue. Spiritus liquors, 1450000 Now you can see that's a big revenue earner for the federal government. Molasses, paying three cents per gallon. $97,000 in revenue. Beer, ale, and porter, 20000 in revenue. Tea, 310000 in revenue. Coffee, 150000 in revenue. Sugar, 390000 in revenue. Indigo, cocoa, pepper, pimento, and cotton, 100000 in revenue. It goes on and on and on. In the end, what its purpose is to tell is that the country's incurring debt. It's being somewhat disguised. From the end of the year 1792 to the end of the year 1795, although the gross amount of receipts has fallen short of the gross amount of expenses, yet as the deficiency has been supplied by anticipations, by domestic loans, which make part of the domestic fund, this fund has been enabled by degrees 
to repay the foreign fund. But even to the 1st of January 1796, almost the whole of the money's in hand, stated as balance and cash in the treasury, has consisted of monies belonging to this last-mentioned fund and arising from foreign loans. In the House, Gallatin goes on to oppose the Adams administration. After Jefferson left federal service and Madison started working in the Virginia legislature. So it was a no-brainer. When Jefferson wins the 1800 election, who are they going to turn to to be Treasury Secretary? Gallatin. In fact, for this purpose, Gallatin updates his sketch of the finances of the United States for 1800 and shows the debt has actually increased since the last edition. Gallatin moves with his family to the muddy new capital, an appendage, really, everything, to the Capitol building. There's a Capitol building there and a group of boarding houses. Yet he gets to work. He has to do the work for nine months before the Senate confirms him. But he does. And he worked out a plan that he'll start to pay down the debt of the United States with a small contribution to debt service each out of each year's budget. Also, while beginning an infrastructure program to build the new Northwest, to build roads and canals there. In fact, Gallatin figures out in his first couple of years as Treasury Secretary, he's going to pay off the United States debt, everything they owe, for the revolution and for the beginnings of the country, for assuming all of those state debts, by 1817. Jefferson's Louisiana purchase does change that. But Gallatin, though thrifty, was not opposed to this purchase. A country, he said, can acquire territory. Yet the federal government under Jefferson resisted large expenditures, resisted calls for a large navy. Gunboats and militia will do. Owning New Orleans and striking the deal of the Louisiana Purchase, diplomacy through peace, will provide the nation with a security that it might not otherwise have. Jefferson spars with Gallatin on one issue, the Bank of the United States. President abhorred the idea of a single bank controlling the finances of the United States. Gallatin liked it, thought it was the only way to proceed, even if it was a Federalist idea. And the bank remained open during Jefferson's presidency, mostly because of Albert Gallatin. This from Nicholas Dungeon's Gallatin, America's Swiss founding father. In the end, for an idealistic Enlightenment president who wished to eschew international affairs, the Louisiana Purchase was an exercise in global real politic without compare. Gallatin provided the financing for the Louisiana Purchase, which unbalanced all his careful bookkeeping. The United States agreed to pay $11.25 million, not in cash, but in 6% loan stock, not redeemable for 15 years. The remainder was to be spent in the United States to satisfy claims that Americans held against France. The Dutch bank Hope and & Company and the British bank Barings were selected to purchase and distribute the American bonds and provide cash to the French. Yes, the British bank is helping to finance the Louisiana Purchase and providing money to Napoleon. Gallatin got to know Alexander Baring in the autumn of 1803 when Baring came to negotiate the transaction in Washington. Gallatin also provided in his budgets for the payment of the additional debt and the interest on it. Once the full implications of the Louisiana Purchase were understood, it was immensely popular and contributed substantially to the landslide re-election of Jefferson in 1804. In his report of December 9, 1805, he indicated that from April 1801 to March 31, 1805, revenues had been $50 million and expenditures $49 million for a surplus of over a million dollars. Another happy outcome of the Louisiana Purchase was the Lewis and Clark Expedition, authorized by Jefferson to explore the new Western territories. The expedition departed from St. Louis on May 14, 1804 and Gallatin's treasury financed it. One of his smallest headaches, since the budget was minimal, although the impact was great. Gallatin, ever the son of Geneva and disciple of Rousseau, took a genuine interest in the content of the expedition himself. Lewis and Clark named a river in Gallatin's honor. 
Gallatin worked long hours, often into the evening, during both of Jefferson's administration. Since Jefferson was a bachelor, Dolly Madison, the wife of the Secretary of State James Madison, took upon herself the role of Supreme Washington hostess, which she later perfected as First Lady. The Gallatin's house on Capitol Hill, however, was a center of entertainment for members of Congress, many of whom were on their own in Washington and resided in boarding houses. They were grateful for the convivial domestic atmosphere. So what we see here, Jefferson, assisted by Gallatin, has a pretty good first term, a good economy, winning congressional elections, a surplus in the federal budget, but a second term brings trouble, and most of them come from the other nations of the world. Here's what John Quincy Adams says. The continent of Europe is not only prostrate at the feet of France, but to all in appearance irretrievably subdued. How long the insular situation of Great Britain and her naval force will enable her to bear up against this universal suppression is not easy to say. Here's what Jefferson says about the world situation. What an awful spectacle does the world exhibit at this instant. One man bestriding the continent of Europe like a colossus, and another roaming unbridled on the ocean. But even this is better that one should rule both elements. Our wish ought to be that he who has armies may not have the dominion of the sea, and that he who has the dominion of the sea may be one who has no army. In this way, we may be quiet, at home at least. It's probably difficult to understand the United States during Jefferson's term. So you're talking about 1805-1806, right? British warships, armed warships, and French warships, though not as many, are entering ports in the United States freely with their cannons. You know, it's not something we would be used to to see an armed foreign force in our waters. But this was what neutrality created, that all ships were welcome. And indeed, there was a business to be had by seaports in the United States supplying water and food and fixing ships. A good, thriving seaport town like Norfolk, Virginia, isn't going to turn away business. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't some trepidation about what was going on. Here's how the British minister in America, Erskine, and it relates it back home. It's highly grating to the feelings of an independent nation to have vessels out there, some degree blockading the nation almost, maybe allowing vessels to pass, but sort of presenting the situation that they always could do something else. If nothing else, always have the feeling that as a neutral nation, you were being watched. Jefferson complains about many abuses of hospitality to the British minister. A cannon from a British ship kills an American. Jefferson temporarily orders warships off of American waters. But even after British ships in need of supplies and waters merely violate these instructions. But when the British sought to intercept French vessels, what happened is some British seamen left the vessel and ran to America, where in ports like Philadelphia, Norfolk, Charleston, they were put on American cruiser, or well accepted by merchant cruisers. We talk about in impressment, and you'll hear that a lot both in the discussion of this time, which is really the lead up to the War of 1812. I think the, the an interesting point that one could make is that, uh, and, and you're going to see in the story we're telling here, is that the War of 1812 really could have started during Jefferson's administration, his second term. It's just that the president happened to change. Same problem. But we talk about impressment so much and this practice of the sailors, um, and it's bad. But I also think you need to think about the problem of desertion that the British were facing, that every time they get near American waters, they start losing their sailors. And they're not able to keep operating this large navy, you know, without keeping hold of their deserters. And so just as we're lodging complaints to the British about impressment, they're lodging complaints to us about deserters. People that are known to be deserters from the British Navy that are being accepted in American ports. That's the other side of it. Nonetheless, impressment was a pretty bad thing, very offensive. It was something that united the country because it, it was offensive to Virginians. It was offensive to, to Marylanders. It was offensive to New Englanders. Here's what uh, Quincy Adams says. This authorized system of kidnapping upon the ocean was practiced under the odious present of a right. 
of the King of Great Britain to force his own subjects into his naval service in a time of war. To the execution of this law, no judge, no jury, no writ of habeas corpus affords the British seamen the protection of liberty and life. Its execution is on the desert of the ocean. Its executors, armed men, every lieutenant or midshipman in the Navy, under no control but his will, under no responsibility but his discretion, interested to seize the men whose service he wants on his own ship, and sure of impunity for the outrage, even if the man should ultimately be discharged and restored to his liberty, the pretense was the right of the king to take his own subjects only. The practice was to presume every man a British subject who was wanted. The burden of proof that he was not a British subject will be put upon the seaman himself. And a Native American could not embark upon the ocean without an authenticated document certifying his name, his age, his stature, and describing his eyes and nose and mouth and chin, the color of his hair, the complexion, and the marks and scars about his person. Whenever an American merchant ship met a British armed vessel at sea, she was visited by a midshipman or lieutenant from the man of war, at whose command her whole crew was summoned upon her deck. And there, every man of them passed in review before this often beardless boy, who compared their persons with their protections, certificates, and finished by taking or leaving the man, just as his temper or fancy decided his choice. June 22, 1807, the U.S. frigate Chesapeake was in the bay of the same name with 370 men ready for a voyage to the Mediterranean. Now, Jefferson, early in his presidency, had successfully fought off the Barbary pirates, and there's still operations going on there. The Chesapeake was out to support these efforts. As the Chesapeake exits the bay, two British ships, warships, lots of cannons are docked in the distance. Okay. But another starts heading right towards her. This would be the HMS Leopard. The Chesapeake, unfortunately, has sowed its cannons for the long voyage, or what was expected to be the long voyage. The Leopard hails the ship. Captain Barron of the Chesapeake gets a message from Captain Humphreys of the Leopard. A request that he is looking for sailors of his on that ship. Captain Barron replies that he knew of no such men. Unless he was actually not correct, but he was right to refuse any boarding of the ship in any case. The Leopard Captain Humphreys said later that he tried to hail again, but Captain Barron claims not to have seen the signal. And then a cannonball shot. Three Americans die, eight are wounded. Barron, unready to fight, the cannons are stowed, not expecting a fight in American waters. He lowers the flag, and a British officer boards, takes three sailors away. Barron, who will be court-martialed, then offers his ship as a prize to Humphreys. Well, you won, right? Humphrey refuses this and goes over the harbor to meet up with the other two British ships. Stunned, and by the way, Captain Barron is one of these people wounded in this exchange. Chesapeake now sulks off to Hampton Roads. And the story is told there, and it reaches Washington two days later on the 24th. When American bodies are unloaded at Hampton Roads, locals are so angry with the British now that they destroy 22 water casks that were intended to be put on these ships. The British are actually upset about this. And an invasion is now feared that they'll go and take the water supplies and gunboats are dispatched. When reported in the National Intelligentsia, the nation is outraged by the Chesapeake incident. Norfolk citizens issue a proclamation, and this is sent to the British ambassador. Citizens say they will not communicate any more with the British and not supply the British warships. A Baltimore meeting headed by Maryland's Sam Smith calls for war. Jefferson comments that the country hasn't been aroused this much as it had since Lexington. 
But in Jefferson's mind, war powers are with Congress. And he wants to give the period, uh, the British, a period for disavowing before acting. On July 2nd, Jefferson issues a proclamation. Assuring neutrality, but calling for honorable reparation and for all British warships to go away. He also makes it illegal by federal law to provide aid to armed British vessels. Federalists find this weak government by proclamation. Oh, for Washington or an Adams to wield the sword of state, says a Federalist newspaper. But John Quincy Adams supports Jefferson. He was a firm and dispassionate reaction. The British ships blockade Norfolk, Virginia, and warn the mayor there that they could, if they want, stop all trade. They don't know about Jefferson's proclamation the day before ordering all ships away. The president also doesn't know what they are doing in Norfolk. Everyone's a bit burdened by the communications. No one's, none of this yet has gotten to London. Jefferson learns three days later. Once he learns, he asks for quick reports from his friends in Virginia. He asks his secretary of war to return. He's in New York. And he also watches, ever the science scientist, a torpedo demonstration by Robert Fulton. But he's got no navy to match the British ships threatening a major seaport. He asks for more gunboats. These are small floating vessels you know, with a single cannon that might be used defensively. He allows the governor of Virginia to use federal funds to pay as much of the militia with federal dollars as needed, and he asks for fortifications. You know, it's DEFCON 3, maybe 1807 style. And for about two weeks, we're coming pretty close to an undeclared Chesapeake War, with Jefferson acting as his own Secretary of War. For Gallatin, he writes to his wife, This is as much an invasion as if they had landed. But British naval arrogance has led them to hostile acts. When the British send a landing party for water supplies, American militia capture them. Governor Cabell doesn't want a war, and he asks the president what to do. Jefferson says there's no qualified war going right now, and until then, the men should be returned. But he says, also, you, Governor, were right to capture them. And any effort to stop provisioning the ships is correct. But the interesting thing about all this going on is that Jefferson, satisfied that the ships will just remain out there and won't invade, actually leaves for Monticello, as he would be prone to do in the summer. And and not wanting the Virginia militia to get diseases in the hot summer, tells the governor to disperse them. The boats remain until autumn, and the British ships hold their distance off the American coast. Uh, What's funny about all this The way communications work, it's August 1st before diplomat James Monroe in Great Britain can learn even of the Chesapeake incident and get word to Jefferson through Madison that will take another month to arrive. Monroe says that the British reaction was to blame the Leopard's captain for acting in an extraordinary fashion. Canning, the foreign secretary, you know, insisted there was no wrong done. You allow deserters on your ships, we justfully search for them. Monroe and Canning spar. Canning tells them, Monroe, that he's going too far for a little bit. Monroe says it's a flagrant abuse of authority. Canning says that you're going too far for a little incident, and he's aware that the time wouldn't allow for instructions from Jefferson, so you're not speaking for him. And Monroe simply doesn't answer. Bested by a superior diplomat. Now, there's a couple incidents going on. The British are at war with Napoleon. And he's just bested Russia. And the British are maneuvering to keep him from seizing Denmark. This is noticed in the United States. In the United States, there's a the newspaper article in the Aurora where William DeWayne, the editor of that, says, we're going to be worse than Denmark, where even if we had a navy, it would just be co-opted by the British, by the superior forces, the way that they act, unless we stand up for ourselves. Nothing will change. We'll be the Danes. Something else. Jenkin Ratford, probably British, was one of the people pulled off the Chesapeake. He's 
court-martialed in Halifax and executed for desertion. This was insulting to James Madison, as he indicated in a note to Monroe. Canning now asks James Monroe about Jefferson's proclamation. What did he actually order? Monroe hasn't heard of it because of the communications and inquires to Madison. There are competing uh, viewpoints. Some are saying that the British don't want this. Jefferson gets a darker word from a friend who is in Great Britain saying that the British may like war right now. It would be more popular than the revolution had been. A war against a republic would be more popular than a war against what were British colonies. And merchants are worried about British naval rights, and naval rights include picking up deserters. Jefferson writes a letter to a friend, rooting for Bonaparte at this time. It pains me to do it. Previously, Jefferson had written that Great Britain was now a bulwark against Napoleon. Now he says he's rooting for him. Pains me to do it, but down with England. England is a real threat now. Bonaparte, a theoretical one. Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, Canning, writes a letter that British will continue to search for their seamen wherever they find them. Jefferson asks for fortification, gunboats, and naval militia. It goes back and forth with letters. He asks uh, the Ambassador Erskine to consider reparations for the Chesapeake. He writes to his son-in-law that Congress must now decide. War, embargo, or nothing. But keywords. Congress must decide. That's the way Jefferson views the American system. But in terms of war, embargo, or nothing, he has a favorite, it appears. And James Madison certainly had a favorite. And that was embargo. A refusal to trade. Embargo, we thought, might be a useful experiment. A kind of weapon of peace that could be used in diplomacy by a republic. In effect, the United States would shut down international trade if nations do not treat us well. Jefferson's popular in the country now. Very little opposition in his own party. The Federalists have been reduced to a regional party. They're trivially, you know, asking questions about expenses. That's about all that they can do. Congress passes the Embargo Act at his suggestion. Gallatin is no fan of embargo. I prefer war to embargo. It's hastily adopted in the first view of foreign intelligence. That is, that British merchants and countrymen beg the government not to lose American business. Government prohibitions always do more mischief than estimated. The embargo devastates seaport towns. Rhode Island sees empty wharfs. So does New London, Connecticut. Vermont, dependent on Canada, and the Lake Champlain border now finds this border closed. No trade. Smuggling's rampant, which surprises Jefferson. I did not expect a crop of so sudden and rank growth of fraud. An open opposition by force could have grown up in the United States. There's either direct smuggling through the Canadian border through various ports, reclassifying documentation, saying something that is domestic shipping when it's actually foreign shipping, um, reclassifying ships, friendly collection officers in certain ports are waving things through, special cargoes, uh, very liberal pardons from the governor of Massachusetts, almost all grain shipments he's allowing in, even during this embargo period. Maine was an open rebellion, and trading with Canada as it saw fit. Jefferson delegates a lot to Gallatin during this period when there's decisions about, for instance, like uh, various you know cases where something might be a mix of international and domestic commerce. He refers it to Gallatin. Jefferson several times says, I have no copy of the law by me when he's asked to make a decision. He, he constantly asks... Gallatin, perhaps we should make proposals to Congress to expand the bill. Gallatin makes certain decisions, because he has to. Ships with cash are refused. No money going out. M using force on vehicles that refuse to comply is approved. That wasn't in the law. Gallatin began to observe the problems of enforcement from a vantage point of New York. The main difficulty was caused by vessels departing without clearance papers in defiance of the law. 
Once at sea, these ships transferred their cargoes to foreign vessels, mostly British, or sailed to Nova Scotia on the West Indies. From New York northward, they could do this much more readily than from the Delaware River or the Chesapeake. The opportunities for evasion were greatest in New England, especially Massachusetts and Maine. Flour legally shipped into Canada commanded such a price that the temptation to engage in smuggling was enormous. And as in revolutionary times, there is no stigma attached to getting the better of a distant government that could be designated of tyrannical as tyrannical. Ships traveling within the U.S. is limited for four months because you had these situations where ships would presumably be going from one port to another and disappear for a long time, which made it seem like they were doing an international voyage. Still, invasion continues. Harass them with a prosecution, Jefferson suggests to Gallatin in various letters. I know, what, I know not what can be done. Increases the fines to $10,000. Cartoons in the press ridicule this embargo, the dumb embargo, or using the same idea, taking the letters of embargo, oh, grab me, oh, go bar them, mob rage, all formed from the letters in embargo. Meanwhile, England was building up a trade with South America and taking over American shipping routes gladly. For New England, where the farm was the sea, the embargo policy was a bad deal. Charles Coates with Pickney and Federalists gained strength in the Northeast. It's only with regional support in the South and West that Jefferson's party can hang on, and that Madison's able to win the election of 1808 while this embargo policy is in place. He is forced to abandon it. Jefferson, and remember, he didn't have to by any law, just, just Washington's tradition, announces he will retire after two terms. James Madison is elected president. This from Nicholas Dungan's Gallatin, America's Swiss founding father. Jefferson fell prey to two simultaneous, seductive, self-reinforcing conclusions. First, that Bonaparte, despite his inability to invade England, would soon cripple the British. Second, that the United States could disable Britain by economic sanctions. But he did not want to choose between the two warring Packer powers, so the only option was a self implode a self-imposed blockade that would return the United States to its position of benign isolation. Gallatin opposed the embargo for both domestic and international reasons. He believed it would have no taming effect of Britain at all and would produce precisely the damage to the American economy that in actuality came to pass. Jefferson did not listen. It is surprising, maybe even disappointing, that he did not choose to resign on principle. So much did the embargo violate all of his precepts of sound financial management, individual liberty, and limited central government. Worst of all, from Gallatin's perspective, the embargo cut off the revenues of the federal government, virtually all of which were duties on international trade, depressed American economic activity with unprecedented brutality, and upset in one blow the careful calculations and prudent frugality that Gallatin had implemented over the prior eight years. And there you have it, uh, the embargo of 1807 and 1808. It's going to lead to another embargo in 1812, which is going to be the lead up to the war of that year. So Jefferson, in his last year, has a crisis that he hands off to the next president. On the other hand, it's, it's hard to see what could have been done. The nation was not prepared for a war, did not have a navy, so to speak. The British had a large fleet. Uh, making no statement at all of any kind of defiance was also not going to work. And I'm someone who thinks that the embargo policy is it was a terrible one and should be viewed with the lens of Thomas Jefferson as a president. Um, at the same time, here is uh, comments from John Adams, Jefferson's opponent in the 1800 election. If you continue the embargo, the times will be hard. If you institute a total non-intercourse, the times will not be more cheerful. If you repeal the embargo, 
Circumstances will occur of more animation, but perhaps not more profit or more comfort. If you arm our merchantmen, there will be war. If you declare war against France and England at once, this will be sublime to be sure. And if we had a Dutch navy, we might gain as much by it as the Dutch did when they warred against England, France, and Spain at once. On Friday, March 3rd, 1809, the National Intelligencer said, Never will it be forgotten, as long as liberty is dear to man, that it was on this day that Thomas Jefferson retired from the Supreme Magistry, admits the blessing and the regrets of millions. It seemed remarkable that one who was crowned with popularity and whose mind was unclouded and unweakened should be voluntary relinquishing power that he might have kept. For Gallatin, he is going to want to become Secretary of State, and James Madison, the incoming president, wants to make him so. They've done eight years now in the Treasury. But it was not to be. He had two major opponents. One was William Branch Giles, who didn't like Gallatin because of his nationality. William Duane, his Aurora newspaper, also took up the cause against him. His other opponents were Senator Samuel Smith, along with his brother Robert, Secretary of the Navy. Gallatin had criticized the Navy Department for spending too much money and made an enemy of the Smiths. The embargo of 1807 to 1809 was, does represent a time where government looked at American commerce and said, essentially, make it stop for one reason or another. And we're going to look at three examples today. In one case, it's about war. It's about possibly punishing an enemy. And there's, we're, we're not sure. There's journal articles on both sides of this. We're not entirely sure whether Jefferson really just wanted a very peaceful step by introducing non-importation or whether he really was almost looking for a wartime step of trying to cripple Great Britain and reduce its power, playing off what Bonaparte was already doing. So there's a variety of reasons for this. We're going to look at another reason, which again has to do with a war and also some contemporary problems that were going on in the industry. And then lastly, we'll look at price increases and commerce being stopped for that reason. Visitors to a country general store in Virginia might not recognize, as they saw a man whittling on a piece of wood, that they were witnessing a revolutionary change in American life and transportation. For Eli Janney, who had served under Robert E. Lee in the Confederate Army, and now a dry goods clerk, he used his lunch breaks to whittle away the time, but it was purposeful whittling, really. He thought that he could save a lot of lives doing it. He took his own hands and clasped them together, joining his left and right fingers together, and then whittled that shape. The train was dangerous. Workers were losing quite literally thousands of fingers a year on train lines as they connected cars together using a pin system, which was very dangerous to remove cars. And workers at that time had little or no compensation when they were injured. Here's what uh, Benjamin Harrison, President Benjamin Harrison, puts in his third State of the Union address. I have twice before urgently called the attention of Congress to the necessity of legislation for the protection of the lives of railroad employees. Nothing has yet been done. During the year ending June 30th, 1890, 369 brakemen were killed and 7,841 maimed while engaged in coupling cars. The total number of railroad employees killed during the year was 2,451, and number injured, 22,390. This is a cruel and largely needless sacrifice. The government spending nearly $1 million annually 
to save the lives of shipwrecked seamen. Every steam vessel is rigidly inspected and required to adopt the most approved safety appliances. All this is good, but how shall we excuse the lack of interest and effort in behalf of this army of brave men who in our land, commerce are being sacrificed every year by the continued use of antiquated and dangerous appliances. Well, that would lead to significant legislation passed during his term and the use of Janie's coupler. Janie's coupler allowed the train cars to clasp each other, just like a set of hands. No human action was needed. It was perfect, and it avoided the cars from moving back and forth. But it would take a dozen to 20 years for Janie to see his coupler taken up in a large way. As we discussed in the Ark of Commerce 3, the loco, our look at railroads and retail, the railroads were celebrated before the Civil War but hated after that. By the 1870s, states had regulations and commissions to rein them in. In 1887, the first federal government regulation is introduced under Grover Cleveland's presidency, the Interstate Commerce Act. It wasn't huge. The pro-business attorney general, Richard Olney, said that supervision would be nominal. But an area of life that touched so many, the federal government had gotten involved. And there were objections. But railroads were, after all, a business-to-business -business provider, a business-serving business. So... For those charged rates that were considered too high, for those that saw, hey, you're giving that preferential treatment to John Rockefeller and his deliverments of oil, deliveries of oil, and not just are you giving him a cheaper price, but you're actually giving him rebates for allowing competitors to ship oil. There was a lot of business support for legislation. Farmers, grange movements, and states were putting pressure on state legislatures and the federal government. William Jennings Bryan, though he rode the rail in his famous 1896 campaign and delivered speeches across the country, thought the railroad needed to be taken on. He was bruised by a defeat in a Nebraska Senate race in 1895 at the hands of a crafty railroad lawyer. And the next year, when he fired away at big money and powerful interests, he was partially talking about those railroads. As VP candidate in 1900, Theodore Roosevelt took the train to chase William Jennings Bryan across the country. Bryan was once again running against the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket. Roosevelt was condemning Bryan. As president, Theodore Roosevelt would end up taking on railroads himself. First, by breaking up Northern Securities, a huge railroad conglomerate. He sued them under the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the company was dissolved. Then in 1906, the Hepburn Act took a shot at the unpopular railroads. Railroad rates now had to be reasonable. Within two years, it was clear consumers and businessmen felt they were not reasonable. Fifteen hundred rate complaints were made to the ICC, that formerly worthless agency that was now toughened. Taft, as president, strengthened the, strengthened the ICC further in 1910, and in 1913, the agency begins assessment of the value of each railroad. This is to start to investigate how much money they are making versus their true costs, so they can determine rates. This government intervention has an effect. Between 1900 and 1916, the rates of the railroad freight drop. They go down slightly while inflation surges 30% during that time. In the run-up to World War I, while the Europeans are fighting and before the United States is involved, war brought great business. 
Allied nations clamoring for machinery, ammunition, meat, shovels, textiles, rope, horses, and other supplies. The railroads ship so much that at one point there's not enough train cars in the west of the United States. Everything's east. You could not get anything fast enough to bring product in time. Goods were spoiling. Factories were closing. And passenger lines are interrupted. Now, war's declared in April 1917. And the U.S. now adds to those allied nations asking for surprise and sending it via the railroad. And orders from Uncle Sam are priority orders. This is mixed with a bad winter in 1917 to 1918, and it cripples things. Woodrow Wilson steps in. I have exercised the powers over the transportation system. There are some things government can do and private management cannot. In this war action, he sets precedent. He establishes the Railroad Administration. The trains formerly robber and barren territory, symbol of money and power, you know, Rockefeller's engine, Vanderbilt's future, are humbled. They become essentially a government agency. And Wilson puts his treasury secretary, also his son-in-law, William Gibbs McAdoo, in charge. Now, McAdoo was no mere beneficiary of family connections here. He had run large projects before, including railroads. Anyone in the New York or New Jersey area who takes a train that's called the path between New York and New Jersey may not be aware that it's William Gibbs McAdoo who is the one who got that tunnel built when he took it over, which attracted the attention of the then governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, who put him in his cabinet. Wilson also moves on Detroit. The War Industries Board is there to set rates, secure materials. Detroit, through the Chamber of Commerce, doesn't want to stop making commercial vehicles. They volunteer to cut auto production 50% in order to support war industries. So, Uncle Sam, we've got one half of Ford, one half of Packard, one half of Dodge, one half of Cadillac, of Mack truck, FWD truck, for wartime production. The offer is rejected. And the War Industries Board says, you will get no steel unless you convert to 100% war production. Take our orders and take your money. With your number one customer being Uncle Sam, you know, cars are a luxury. They're for passengers. They're for luxury rides, and they want production of cars to stop January 1st, 1919. Well, Detroit didn't like this very much, and certainly the dealerships really didn't like it. They're the ones that are going to be most impacted now. They would starve with no new cars to sell. People need cars to get to work, to do business. It's not just about luxury rides. Why, Woodrow Wilson drives a car, we know it. And in 1917, 50% of cars were bought by farmers. This is not luxury vehicles. So, after some lobbying of the White House, we go back to the 50% number, and 50% was agreed to. 50% of plants had to be used for U.S. war production, the rest for pleasure cars. Oh, make that passenger cars, as they were renamed during the war. Detroit was part of World War I, and the U.S. war effort, really before the Model Ts are used all over France as ambulances. John Dodge helped the French build the 75 and 155 cannons. Packard's designs airplanes. GM, Buick, and Cadillac designed uh, Liberty engines for those airplanes. 40,000 Indian motorcycles were shipped to the Western Front. But this step is temporary. Car production under these orders, the 50% pleasure, 50% for war industries, ends Four days after the armistice. 
Meanwhile, with the railroads, the U.S. Railroad Administration controls those railroads until November 1920 and regulated them heavily after that. The dual involvement of the not-so-invisible hand here picked a winner, in part. Detroit gained as an alternative to rail. Roads were built by states with federal support. Well, railroads were not greatly improved. I mean, one of the things that happens during the, uh, with Mikadu running the railroads, and initially, you know, one of the reasons that they don't have too many political problems taking over the railroads is that it's a war and such legislation is needed, but also that the railroads are fed up and the railroads have such infrastructure problems and need a little bit more force. They're having problem with supply of cars. So one of the things a government can do that the railroad system under private enterprise was having trouble doing is, for instance, they could suspend the railroad while train cars got back west. They're also able to control rates, but with rate control, investment in rail lines wasn't happening. And it is, in fact, William Gibbs McAdoo is forced to execute a price increase in fall 1918. Badly timed with the 1918 midterms. Here's what McAdoo said. What is government for? Is it something in a straitjacket? Is it sitting in a corner like a thing with palsied hands, afraid to act? Or is it something vital? Is it something to come to the front and do things for the American people when private capital cannot be commanded or commandeered or persuaded to that purpose? It does not seem to me that there is room for argument. President Nixon loved football and watched a lot of it on television, usually with the sound off, so that he could do paperwork and make telephone calls at the same time. Now this from Richard Reeves, President Nixon. On New Year's Day, 1971, like millions of his fellow Americans, he would begin watching the college bowl games after lunch and continue through to the end of the Rose Bowl at 9 o'clock or so Eastern Time. On the first day of 1971, the president was at Camp David with his family, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, and their families. It was a crystal and white day. More than a foot of snow had fallen during the day and the night before, but the president was unhappy. He called Billy Graham and Bob Hope to announce that for the first time, he was rooting against the West Coast team in the big game from Pasadena. He told them he was for Ohio State over Stanford because he had seen a story in the Washington Post saying, that the Stanford quarterback, Jim Plunkett, had posed for photographs with topless dancers in San Francisco. Two days later, Nixon spotted an item in his news summary that said, Don Larrabee writes in the Greenville News in South Carolina that Richard Nixon may have set some kind of presidential record during the holiday season for numbers of hours spent in front of the TV watching football. Richard Nixon's interest in sports puts him on comfortable ground with most males. White House aides has been astounded by Nixon's statistical knowledge of sports. Many would take that as a compliment, but not Nixon. He sent a rocket to Chuck Colson, asking him to get out there in the press that the president only watches part of games and never during any national emergencies. The boss is in love again. That's how a peeved Bob Haldeman described Richard Nixon's latest favorite of a new employee of the administration. 
Uh, before it had been Pat Moynihan, a Democrat with new ideas on welfare and education. That faded, and lately in 1971, it was John Connolly, yes, the governor of Texas, who was in the car with JFK when he was shot, also shot himself. Um, Connolly was a popular governor in Texas, gave him confidence. He's a friend of Lyndon Johnson. He wasn't really a finance person, but he did know politics. And the Democrats in the Senate had no problem at all appointing him Treasury Secretary. Nixon needed Texas in 1972. It lost it in 1968. Humphrey won there. Richard Nixon didn't have a lot of economics knowledge. He was a foreign policy guy. And his Fed chair, Arthur Burns, they used to see eye to eye, and now they didn't. But he, like all bankers, was concerned with inflation. Since Kennedy's time, the U.S. government saw itself as a manager of inflation. It had the computers. It had the data. The largest customer for computers, the Defense Department, governments. Nixon had worked in the Price Administration office after World War II, a junior attorney working in a department concerned with rationing tires. He was familiar with economic controls. He didn't like them. And he didn't like how big Washington had become. But something changed here. Style, vogue, it became okay during the 60s to get more involved. Conservatives outside of Milton Friedman, who advised Nixon, had their voice. But most expected the government to manage the economy. In 1960, a brief brief recession near the election was what Nixon felt as did Arthur Burns, his current Fed chair, was responsible for his losing the election. Now I'm a Keynesian, Nixon said, reflecting the economists who wanted public spending, infusion of cash to the economy to boost it. He had a lot of flack from conservatives and left it to his aides to answer those letters. When a Republican congressman said that he could and would support Nixon's new economic policies, but he'd have to burn up his speeches. Nixon replied, I'm in the same boat. There was a reason for all this. The inflation, the increase of prices, was 1.5% in the 1960s, and it was up to 5%. Unemployment, 5%. Too far for confidence. Burns was a light Keynesian, but in 1971 he felt differently about things. Wages forced by post-war Deals with unions, contracts, private contracts, and then Bacon Davis um, legislation that required federal construction or federal finance construction to use un- to pay union wages. This is about one third of all construction. Prices are going up too high from these automatic increases. Burns wanted a wage price review board, but not to enforce supply, just to persuade, recommend, publicize any deals that are made that are harmful to American interest. Shame juicy contracts to either unions or price increases that might be bad for consumers that they'll have to pay for. Nixon didn't like it. He didn't like the voluntary aspect of it. And Connolly didn't like it either. Connolly was not in favor of controls originally. Nobody was in the White House, not Nixon himself. But more than anyone... He saw acting in a small way as a waste of time. Take it by the neck, he would say. Inflation was like a turkey. Nixon was delighted, and he was worried about Burns getting too much press for his voluntary board. Try to get ahead of him, he told his aides. But a couple of events happened. One is that inflation is creeping up, and the other that is that the election is coming soon. This from Richard Reeves. For a time, Nixon focused his frustration on meat prices, maybe because he was a grocer's son. When meat prices rose, he issued one of his wilder orders, this one to Secretary of Agriculture Clifford Hardin, telling him he wanted meat prices reduced by the next Monday, or else. Nothing happened, of course. So he ordered the Council of Economic Advisors to give him a report on profiteering or collusion by supermarkets. When the Council's chairman, Paul McCracken, reported back that there was no evidence of that, uh, and 
he makes commentary that's available on Nixon tapes about he makes anti-Semitic comments about the ownership of supermarkets to his aid. Something else happens. The Democrats in control of the Senate and the House, they give Nixon the right to establish price and wage controls. So that if he doesn't use the power, it'll be on him. When they pass that bill, he vows he'll never use it. But you see commentary in early 1971. Nixon doesn't want to just be making decisions in 1972, the election year. He's a political animal in a sense. He's aware of all the various precincts of what opinion is in, in different parts of the country. And we really got to think about goosing it, he says in one of his meetings. By June, Connolly convinces him, you're going to have to do a wage board in the next year and a half. The implication, do it now, fine. Do it in 72, it'll look like desperation, like you were forced to do it. Plus, inflation could re- reach 7%, according to Treasury estimates. It did not turn out to be the case. In August 1971, Nixon interrupts the Cartwright family, the popular Bonanza TV show. He has to do this because he wants a primetime speech before the markets open on a Monday. Bonanza's on Sunday night. Good evening. I've addressed the nation a number of times over the past two years on the problems of ending a war. Because of the progress we have made toward achieving that goal, this Sunday evening is an appropriate time for us to turn our attention to the challenges of peace. America today has the best opportunity in this century to achieve two of its greatest ideals, to bring about a full generation of peace and to create a new prosperity without war. He calls for a temporary 90-day limit on wage and price increases, and then an examination period and a possible establishment of a a permanent wage board. 100,000 cars sold means 25,000 new jobs. The step is popular with the public. The speech is popular, and most, if not all, of the economists. A 10% job development credit for one year effective as of today, with a 5% credit after August 15, 1972. Plus, Nixon at the same time takes the nation off the gold standard. And the dollar falls. So he wants this as a protective measure. Initially, it works. Inflation's under 3% in 1971. Burns tightens the money supply at the same time. Prime rate goes up a quarter point. It worked. It all works for inflation. But unemployment was not going down. And then... 90-day temporary freeze became a wage and price administration. A nation like a person has to have a certain inner drive in order to succeed. In economic affairs, that inner drive is called the competitive spirit. Every action I have taken tonight is designed to nurture and stimulate that competitive spirit. To help us snap out of the self-doubt, the self-disparagement that saps our energy and erodes our confidence in ourselves. Government, with all of its powers, does not hold the key to the success of a people. That key, my fellow Americans, is in your hands. Whether this nation stays number one in the world's economy or resigns itself to second, third, or fourth place, whether we as a people have faith in ourselves, or lose that faith. Whether we hold fast to the strength that makes peace and freedom possible in this world, or lose our grip, all that depends on you, on your competitive spirit, your sense of personal destiny, your pride in your country, and in yourself. Nixon was reelected in 1972, but that was against McGovern, with Connolly and a lot of Democrats behind Nixon, the Democrats holding both houses of Congress in a lonely landslide, with Nixon winning as well as Democrats all over the country. After Watergate and the oil embargo, Nixon brings back price controls in 1973. Now you're getting reports of ruinous things happening, you know, farmers 
not bringing cattle to market, waiting for the wage price board to be over. Uh, consumers emptying supermarket shelves at the low prices and the shelves not filling again. Inflation surges to 9% in 1974. And while inflation is always a concern, it will be until the 1980s when oil prices change and technology efficiencies kick in before it goes down. But nobody, not Ford, not Carter, not Reagan, not Clinton, tries a wage price board again. March 1980, inflation is 14%. So it was at all Nixon's fault that the prices went up so quickly. Um, was this all Nixon's fault? No, I mean, it was a mixture of regular price increases, oil prices, uh, related transportation, energy generation, heating costs that drove up the price of everything. Political blamers don't like multivarious situations. Voters in elections, managers of campaigns don't like multivariate reasons for things. But certainly the board was one factor, but it couldn't be all. A forgotten policy with political effects. You know, really long-standing political effects because Nixon engages in something and Nixon becomes the last actor in a sense, or at least the last recent actor in a type of policy that will be, that even Democrats are hesitant to use, that Ford and Carter are hesitant to use, and Reagan will actually engage in Reaganomics, the opposite of Nixon's economic program. No matter how much he supported Nixon during Watergate, he opposes these economic steps. Angry voters. You know, inflation brings something where angry voters are now angry at governments as well as big businesses. And the large Keynesian, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon policies just don't look as attractive as they once did. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, Arca Commerce 4, Make It Stop, where we looked at three different times where commerce was stopped. I want to thank you for listening. And remember, you can support the extra po podcast. You can support me, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com and support and get the extra podcast and you can get even more content and help me out. Thanks for listening.